Hey guys and welcome to today's video. So I have a very interesting guest. I've got with me Ash from Outlier Linguistics. So Ash has studied Chinese for a very, very long time. He's doing a PhD in Taiwan in Chinese phonology and he's done a lot of work with Chinese characters and looking at classical texts and things like that. So very, very excited to have him on and share a bit about what he's learned. So do you want to give a brief introduction to yourself and what you guys do over at Outlier Linguistics, Ash? Sure. Uh, one tiny point of correction, my PhD is actually in old Chinese phonology uh, okay. and paleography. So it's basically reconstructions of the language from 3000 years ago, to say it in simple terms. And paleography, like a lot of people don't know that word, so I always explain it's just the origin and evolution of the script. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we do at Outlier basically is, uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to think of the easiest, the easiest way to say it is Chinese characters have patterns of sound and meaning representation within the mm -hmm. characters. If you can access those sound and meaning patterns, you can use them to recall characters, understand characters you haven't learned. or I mean, make intelligent guesses about characters you haven't learned yet and to better learn the ones that you want to learn. And so, like, we use – I'm getting a, this PhD in old Chinese phonology, and that, that actually – is relevant to what Outlier does because when you're trying to figure out if a part of a character is giving a sound or not, you need to understand the phonology at the time the character was created. Okay, so mm -hmm. obviously that's for research. I'm not saying a student of Chinese yeah. should know anything about that. And I, I guess uh, I was going to say an, an example of that because sure. you briefly spoke like five minutes before this is if you look at like um, and you look at the character her. Well, even though the right size of the phonology in Mandarin, at least the sounds drifted now, but in stuff like Cantonese, you can actually see that, that they're still the same. So that's quite interesting as well. I guess Cantonese would help maybe in that respect. It's the, okay, so this is kind of an interesting point. It does sometimes, but then sometimes it, it's not always true that Cantonese always retains a distinction or always maintains a similarity and Mandarin always doesn't. It's actually sometimes Mandarin does and sometimes Cantonese doesn't. Like, for instance, uh, like, yeah, the sound yeah mm -hmm. in Cantonese is actually a newer sound. So that's actually a divergence from an older sound. So in Mandarin, yang is like the really old version, towards yang would be new. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is true that on average, Cantonese maintains more ancient distinctions than Mandarin. That's definitely true because Mandarin lost the entering tones, for, for instance, which Cantonese like ta and taka, that ending, that the consonant ending there uh, is lost in Mandarin. Yeah. Oh, is that that what they call the? Is that called a glottal stop, like the when you cut off your throat? You mean? Uh, okay, so already confusing things. <laughs> no, 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 no. Actually, it's related. Uh, so what it is, it's different from like for instance, the one I said was D A K. So the K in oh. Cantonese is different from than English. In English, we would say duck. And it would be mm -hmm. aspirated, meaning that 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 puff of air would come out. But in Cantonese, it's not. So you just say ta, ta. Mm -hmm. Well, an unaspirated k at the end of a syllable sounds a lot like a glottal stop. And in fact, before before the entering tones disappear in a Chinese dialect, they will become glottal stop first, uh, and then yeah. later they will and later they will disappear, which is exactly what happened in Mandarin. They first became glottal stops. And in fact, there are Mandarin dialects, not not southern dialects, but actually dialects of Mandarin that have glottal stop entering tones still. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they're very closely wow. related. Yeah, good observation. <laughs> yeah, so I guess that just gives, uh, even based on the past few minutes, just gives an idea of just the depth of knowledge that you have on the Chinese language in general. And uh, to put it into perspective, he's been studying Chinese longer than I've been alive, which is an absolute <laughs> wealth of experience. So I'm really happy to... Uh, to talk to him today so i guess um follow, following that method then you're trying to mostly access i guess this being able to recognize the different types of characters and i know you mentioned that um looking at recognizing sound components of the character so i guess normally on the right hand side of the character i think it is they they have a lot of um other smaller characters or smaller components that represent sort of the sound of the character and if you see it then you can guess sort of what the pronunciation is, maybe not get the tone right, but probably get the pronunciation at least close. Well, okay. So the tones pretty much don't count when it comes to sound components. 
I mean, there are, there are a small number of sound components that actually have a tight connection to a tone, but tones actually did not exist when most characters were created. Oh, wow. So they didn't have tones in like, or if they did, at that time? That's, I mean, obviously we don't have recordings, but, but the first time tones are mentioned by in, in Chinese, in a Chinese like historical text, would, I think is around 4 or 500 A.D., Right, and then there's if you look at the tones in Middle Chinese, and then you look at rhyming in the Shijing, the Book of Odes. Well, the Book of Odes is from way before Middle Chinese. Middle Chinese is roughly like Sui Tang Dynasty era, and the Shijing is like roughly I'm just roughly speaking 300 BC to like a thousand BC. It's like a 700 year period. Um, and if you look at the rhyming patterns within the Shijing, they're very the tones obviously aren't what's causing rhymes, so the, they're not really considered rhymes. So that, and then there's if you look at the Xiesheng series, which is basically when all you take a you take a sound component, all the characters that share that same sound component, and look at their sounds, uh, tones don't really play a role there either. So. Mm-hmm. Know that off the top of your head, tones aren't going to really matter much when it comes to sound components. Yeah, but I guess it's still a lot helpful, very helpful for, um, I guess, recognizing and helping identify and learn new characters. Um, I guess there's those two things that I just kind of thought when you said that, and I guess I don't want to diverge too much onto a tangent already. But, um, <laughs> I, I guess I, I wonder if maybe the first thing, and this would just just guesswork by me because I'm just trying, I'm just going with what you just said, is that I wonder if at the time, they didn't start, you know, talking about tones until that late into the Chinese, is because it was such a natural thing, so they wouldn't necessarily have thought about it. it was just a subconscious thing to them, so they might not actually analyze it and kind of realize on a conscious level that they have tones. Or maybe the other possibility potentially would be that I think in classical Chinese, I don't, I think at least when it was Chinese characters were first created, I don't think it was necessarily a one-to-one um, in terms of what was spoken at the time as Maybe I'm wrong on this, but at least to what I understand, and I know a lot of information. Did your classical Chinese? Out. Did your ch- classical Chinese teacher tell you that? Um, she said there was some. Yeah, I think she said there was some differences between how they spoke at the time, saying they leave a lot of information out. So it's, yeah. Well, okay. So there's a couple things that you said. There, there, there's much more to it than simply the first mention of tones. But if if, if the first mention of tones was all we had to go on, then you would be correct. I mean, obviously, you know, in, in fact, like, for instance, have, if you've ever tried to explain how to use the word the to a non-native English speaker, you'll realize it's super difficult to explain. And the reason is exactly the reason you're saying is because you're too close to the problem because you're a native speaker. Right. In fact, I, I've done research right. on the, and it took me years and years and years of thinking and study to figure out what the actually does, <laughs> the actual job of the, and it's not what most people say it is. Yeah, I mean, if you ask if you ask me, I'd probably just say, well, if this one sounds weird and this one sounds kind of right, and I can't really couldn't really go into any more detail than that. Exactly. So that's native speaker into in, intuition, right? Uh, but but back to the character problem, it it. They probably did actually speak the way they wrote. It's just that they weren't pronouncing it like we pronounce Mandarin. So right, the, okay. the old Chinese syllable was much more complex than even the middle Chinese syllable, let alone Mandarin, which Mandarin has a cr- super, super simple syllable structure, uh, which is why there's so many homonyms. Like, for instance, there aren't as many homonyms in Cantonese because the Cantonese syllable structure is more complex than, than Mandarin. But the old Chinese syllable is more complex than middle Chinese. Like, they had consonant clusters, uh, for instance, which they don't have in, even in middle Chinese. So back then, even though the characters look very, it's the, the words might look simple, and like if you're speaking, if you're pronouncing these classical texts in Mandarin, it sounds like everything sounds the same. That would not have been true for a native speaker back in those days. All right, okay, so I guess maybe the maybe there would be less of a need for tones. Like in English, for example, you don't need tones because of the amount of different sounds in the language and the length of words. I mean, you could put together enough combinations without having tones as a requirement, right? So I wonder if well, it's, that has anything to okay, do with it. That's the wrong angle to look at it. This is how Chinese teachers talk about it. I, I, 
because I, like I said, I, well, I told you, I don't remember if I told the audience, but I was in a teaching Chinese program, mm -hmm. a PhD program for like six years. So I have a lot of experience talking with native speakers about Chinese or whatever. And you'll hear them say stuff like Chinese needs tones because we don't have enough different syllables. Right. But that's not, it's not like they got together and decided, Hey, we don't have enough syllables. What are we going to do about it? Oh, I know we'll use tones. Right. Tone tones actually arise from from the simplification of a syllable. So when parts of syllables start falling away, they leave remnants behind and tones are, are one possibility for the remnant of a syllable becoming more sim simple. Mm -hmm. And actually, this has been measured in other languages like they sh there's two. I, I think it's Hindi and a dialect of Hindi, but I might be wrong that. Where they actually show lists of words where one of them is a Hindi word that's not doesn't, that's not tonal, and the other one's the dialect, and it's missing certain parts of the syllable, but it has tones. So, and actually, this whole tonal genesis question is also one of the reasons they think there weren't tones in Old Chinese, because these tones come from certain endings that were on words in Old Chinese, but. So, so anyway, the, the right way to say it is basically <laughs> tones arise due to parts of syllables falling off, essentially. And a lot of things oh. have fallen off in Mandarin. But but even in Cantonese, where less has fallen off, there's still tones in Cantonese. Also tones in Middle Chinese. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I guess, I guess the way they evolved must have been different because, I mean, people always quote Cantonese as having a lot more tones in Mandarin. Even, I guess even though they only teach six now, which is not too much more, especially if you count the neutral tone making it five in Mandarin, it's not that much of a difference. But I guess it's if they have less sounds that have fallen off, but more tones, it's quite interesting to see that when you look at the evolution, then they might have actually been quite different and so, with different okay. results from the same process. So Cantonese has more tones than Middle Chinese because certain tones split. And in fact, you can map you can map tones. I don't know if you know this, but you can map tones between Cantonese and Mandarin. So if you know the Cantonese tone of a word, as long as it's not an in entering tone, then you then you can know with a pretty good degree of certainty what the Mandarin tone will be. Wow, I did not know that. I I, I know there's certain um, like sounds that have like a mapping, so you know like a certain sound in you know like say I don't know like some K's in. Cantonese will become like a G sound, all in the pinyin, like a G sound in uh, Mandarin, for example. I didn't know you could have that with uh, like tones as well. Well, if you think of like, so a third tone in Mandarin comes from shang, 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 shang is the name of the middle Chinese tone, which is written with the character shang, like on top of shang or on. Mm -hmm. But in middle, for, for the middle Chinese tone name, it's pronounced with a third tone, so it's shang, shang. So Shangsheng is the origin of. This is roughly speaking, there are exceptions to this, but basically it's the it's, it's the origin of the third tone in Mandarin, and it's the origin of the low rising tone in Cantonese and the high rising tone. So if you think of a like for so instance, you mean, in so, so that the fifth and second tone, I guess in Cantonese was originally one, and then they split later. Is that what you mean? Yes. Because yes. I've actually so, heard people say they're merging back together now. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a thing that happens in language. It, it, it splits, goes back together. And in fact, there's some things will split and some things will go back together and then other things will split and go back. It's, it's really, mm -hmm. it happens all the time. Yeah. Well, but if you think of, think of, a, think of, think of a low, uh, a low rising tone in Cantonese, like nga, nga, nga hai, me go yan. Nga is what? It's the third tone in Mandarin, right? Yeah, and then fifth in, uh, and if you say like um, a, a, a high rising tone in Cantonese is going to be a third tone like, in Mandarin. Okay, so I was going to say gong. But that gong, yeah, yeah, exactly. Do you jiang. know what word? Jiang. Gong, yeah, jiang. Right, exactly. Okay, well, that's a uh, that's really interesting, actually. Oh, I, I guess that's also why there'd be one extra if they split. So there's one more in Cantonese then. Well, so have it's you hard like to know. documented that anywhere on any of the blog posts or anything that or any papers or something that you can link to in the description? Because that would well, be quite I mean, interesting, especially for someone like me who's 
struggles mixing up the tones and especially the energy. That's why that's why I'm telling you because it's useful if you know the two languages. If like if you're totally certain of a tone in Cantonese, then you can help it with your Mandarin. If you're totally certain of the tone in Mandarin, it helps with Cantonese. But it doesn't it doesn't work for Rusheng characters. Mm-hmm. And it only and even without Rusheng characters, it's not a hundred percent. Like there's certain historical things mm-hmm. like 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 you should. In Mandarin, the U is right, Yu Shi, mm-hmm. which would which would actually correspond to a low falling tone in Cantonese, but in Cantonese you say Yu, oh, okay. Yu Shi. So but that's, well, Cantonese is actually historically correct, and Mandarin, the Mandarin rising tone is the result of a reinterpretation of a character's sound. Mm-hmm. So the Mandarin, the Mandarin rising tone there actually doesn't fall in line with historical Chinese. I mean, not, that's not a crime or anything, but. <laughs> But it just doesn't, and then and then you yeah, have situations. Normal evolution of language, I guess. Like think things, is, it's just like a big game of Chinese whispers, isn't it? So things get dropped or changed or. Right. So so. Are. You also have cases where there's a there's like say two or three readings in Middle Chinese, and then Mandarin uses one of them, and Cantonese uses a different one, so they don't oh. map. Right. So that happens from time to time, but on average, it works out pretty well. Like about 80, 85 percent of the time, it works. So. I guess going back to the thing then, so do you have any? Um, and that documented anywhere because I know you've talked about it a bit there about the origin the way they uh, kind of sort of match up is there that written down in any research papers or something or oh yeah course? I mean this, uh, it's a very common yeah. thing talked about within like dialectology I mean I haven't written any papers on it although I have written down I can write down the connections and send them send you what the connections are so that you know I mean yeah and I can put it in the description of the video if you don't mind yeah yeah and then you can so you can also like th- these also go back to middle Chinese tones, right? So in middle Chinese you had four tones like ping, ping shang chu ru, mm-hmm. and like Mandarin Mandarin first tone and second tones mostly come from ping shang. They split because of the the voicing of the initial. So like like for instance voiced initials in Mandarin, which there aren't many, but there's like n like ning or or whatever mm-hmm. or l. If you have an N or an L or an M as the initial, those words are almost never going to have a first tone. I mean, every, there's some exceptions there, but most of the time won't have a first tone. And it, it's due to the voicing of that consonant. You know. Oh, that's really interesting. Well, we haven't even really talked about characters <laughs> very much. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm really glad we did, even if no one in the... Even if no one in the comments or whatever likes it, I just think it's quite interesting. This, I've not really heard anyone talk about it in that level of detail before, so that's kind of really fascinating. So in, in so that means maybe a stupid question. Do we have an accurate idea of how Middle Chinese actually sounded then can trace it back? And could okay, people so, like try to like speak Middle Chinese now? Are there any like audio recordings? Oh, you can find it and stuff? you can find videos on YouTube of people doing it. I don't know how much it sounds like Middle Chinese actually sounded, or that, it's actually a really complicated question. But to give you an, an easy answer, there are are rhyme books from the Middle Chinese era. So the earliest one being the Chie Yun, and you can look this up on Wikipedia or whatever. Chie Yun, and the Chie Yun, basically a bunch of and then there's a there's actually a, a, a pre or preface to this where the guy who wrote the book. Actually, it was him and a bunch of other guys sat down and drank, drank wine and talked about the way people uh, said different words in different parts of China. And this is like the fifth century, right? So it's pretty interesting. But he, so they they actually have this book, uh, there are actually quite a few rhyme books. There's a whole rhyme book tradition, in fact, within Chinese culture. And these rhyme books will tell you which characters have the same initial, which characters have the same endings. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this, in a, they don't actually talk about it the way people in modern ways talk about it, so you have to go in and learn how they talk about it. Mm-hmm. But they distinguish all these things. So which characters rhymed in the Middle Chinese period, we have a really good idea. But the problem is, like, what is Middle Chinese? I mean, what is what is this language they're talking about? Like, And if I take a, a modern dictionary, for instance, a modern if you were to take a modern dictionary and learn English from it without hearing what people say, assuming you could actually do that, which you can't because you'd have to hear, but if you could do that, you still wouldn't speak like a native speaker. And the reason is a dictionary will show you all the distinctions people make, but not any one speaker makes all those distinctions. Mm-hmm. 
And I'll give you an example. Yeah, I think there's that quote that there's not so much of however many languages, there's just 7 billion different ways of speaking on the planet, and it's all like whichever one's slightly closer or further away from each other. That's a very accurate way of looking at it, actually. Yeah. So, like, my grandparents would say Mary for the girl's name, Murray for Merry Christmas, mm -hmm. and then to get married. And for mm -hmm. me, it's all the same. It's all Mary, Mary, and Mary. So, and, and we're in the same country, you know, I'm from roughly the same place they are, yet they make three distinctions that I don't make, right? So, the, the Chia Yun is actually probably a book of distinctions of what every, all the distinctions that different people made in different places, but it probably doesn't represent one synchron synchronic language, synchronic meaning at yeah. one time period. It's probably not just a single language. So, even if you were to reconstruct Middle Chinese pronunciation, there's a good chance you're not going to sound like somebody from that time period, even if you were to do that. I mean, that was about to be my next thing I was going to ask as well, because I know, for example, with English, when people talk about, I forgot the name, I don't think it's called ancient English, is it called Old English? When you have, well, at least in England, a few, you know, a few years back, you split it up and it wasn't just like one standard of English, there was different variants of Old English, like there was like the old... Saxon one, I think there was like various different types, and then there was also different languages like Scots and Welsh and Gaelic and things like that. So now that when English has kind of standardized, a lot of these parts from the different bits of English have kind of turned into what we call regional accents now and kind of left behind that like flavor. But at the time, a lot of them weren't even mutually intelligible, and it wasn't until I think in the 1900s when, or maybe it was the 1800s, when London became you know more. Um, like prominent and like it became an economic superpower and everything started to become more standardized and actually mutually intelligible later so I guess other countries especially one if it's a case for a small island then it'd definitely be the case for something as big as China especially right. considering for a large part of the history it wasn't even one country right so that's uh, makes a lot of sense cool. it's a very complex language situation in China yeah yeah well that's really interesting and now I guess <laughs> time to talk about what we actually self to talk about and start with the video <laughs> almost characters later. So, so <clears throat> using the knowledge of um, the sound component of characters to kind of teach and help learn and help people acquire characters faster. Um, I guess I guess that only quite uh, only translates to what roughly me, like seventy percent of the characters. So I guess there's also other things that you build on as well before that, right? So you also would do like the basic basic pictographs and maybe start with that, do you, and then go to the sound elements later? Or? So okay, so let me let me let me give you an overrun of our system real quick. Mm -hmm. So uh, because you mentioned earlier about character types, right? Like when I came up when I came up with this system, my initial intention was to come up with new character types that actually reflect reality. Mm -hmm. But what I found out was that if you understand the working parts of the character, it doesn't matter what type it is. Like, it doesn't matter if you ca I mean, if you want to categorize characters, I guess it matters. But if you don't, if you're just trying to learn them and what, what's really important is understanding why that character looks the way it does. Okay. Mm -hmm. So like one, one thing so I've, I've understand done. The etymology of why it is. Well, it is. I mean. Okay, so we have blog posts about etymology and what does that mean? Because it means different things to different people. And when I say etymology, some people will run screaming from that, thinking that I'm talking about you have to memorize some story about how this character worked in ancient times, right? Which is not at all what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. What I'm talking about is what are the moving parts in a character? Like, like if you get on the internet and look at how do you split up this character, you're going to get a gazillion different answers for the same character because most people are doing it based on completely wrong ideas, right? And 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 my point here too is not about to be correct. I don't. I mean, correct is important, but it's it's not important in and of itself. It's important. It's about making to, it easy to learn and digest the information. That's exactly what it's about. If you want to understand, if you okay, so the first. The first rule of effective memorization of anything, no matter what it is, the first rule is understanding, right? If you understand something, you're far more likely to recall that thing, and it's going to be easier to remember if you understand it. And I'm sure any anybody it's out otherwise there... Otherwise, it's not memorizing. You know, people look at a Chinese character, the one thing they say is, how am I going to memorize thousands of unconnected 
drawings when each one has, you know, multiple strokes. And it's like, well, it's not quite the case. It's they are connected. And if you follow, right. you know, and our, even even if you don't do it on a conscious level, our brains are pattern recognition machines. So after a certain amount of exposure, you start to draw connections and be like, oh, well, that bit was on the right of that character and it sounded like this. And you can start to pick up patterns anyway just through a lot of exposure. But the actual formal study helps accelerate that process by quite a bit, I think, as well. Yeah. You're, you're very correct. And what we're trying to do is to, one, get those connections to you the fastest way possible in the most painless way possible. Okay, that's our goal. And also, just because of Mandarin and the difference between Mandarin and Old Chinese and the differences between Mandarin, well, Mandarin pronunciation and Old Chinese pronunciation in the meanings too, right? Like, so you, it's not just enough to hear some etymological story. You need to understand a certain few key points. And what we use is a fun, okay, we use a system called functional components. And what that means is we break a character down into the parts that are have that have a function in that character, right? So if you get on some of these websites, they'll break, you know, like say bu fun de bu, they'll break it into like li ko and then the right side, right? But that doesn't make any sense. Li and ko have nothing to do with bu. Together they form a component pronounced fo, and that component is the sound component in bu but if you try to use li like stand up in mouth to understand why this character looks the way it does you've already lost before you start because it's got nothing to do with li it's got nothing to do with ko and then you end up having to come up with some random story crazy story in your head to try and memorize it and use your imagination instead of trying to understand what's actually there in front of you so okay so there's a there's a bunch in what you just said why do people use stories? What is it about story? Why why is using stories good in a lot of cases? Well, I guess the most um, the, the, the probably the biggest thing is that if if your brain can associate the new piece of information to something you already know, it's more likely to latch onto it. Because I guess in a survival situation, when you're trying to think, you know, okay, the water's there, the the trees are there, the food's there, the the predators to look out for are there, and it's all very visual and kind of spatial in our brain. So I guess when we've evolved our brains kind of got used to kind of recognizing these patterns and or picking up and associating it with things like that. So if you can come up with a story and come up with a lot of connections and associate the things you know, then I guess it's going to be a lot easier to stick in your brain. Okay, so once once again, there's a whole lot in what you said, but rule number one, meaning. If you make up a story for a character, what it does is it gives meaning to you. Even if that meaning's got nothing to do with the actual character, there's a meaning for you, right? So that's number one. Association is another rule of effective memorization. I think it's three or four or something, but it's one of the, it's a very important rule. Associating, whenever you want to learn anything new, if you can associate it with something you already know, it's going to be way easier than if you don't, right? Mm-hmm. So, so you, exactly right. It gives meaning to you. It also provides association. Okay. So, cause a lot of people say because I, because I, I try to, sh- we try to show, the actual functional components in the character that we don't that we're against memory stories, which is nonsense. We're not at all. In fact, I use memory stories myself to learn Chinese. Um, what we do say is that you should understand the actual structure of a character, and then build your memory story on the actual structure. Because what's going to happen is the better you understand Chinese character structure, the faster you're going to be able to see patterns between characters. And it's those patterns between characters that are going to allow you to remember stuff more easily, recall stuff that you've already learned, and to make intelligent predictions about characters that you haven't learned yet. And, like, I predicted before we ever started selling our stuff that these are the results of using our method. And I get we get messages from uh, people that use our stuff going, oh, my God, I saw this character. I've never seen it before. And I was able to guess its meaning and sound, and I've never seen it before. And, you know, that's a total shot in the arm, right? You're like, oh, my God, I have a superpower. And the thing is, so so what you were saying earlier about if you say say you learn thousands of characters, you're going to get some of these patterns just by the fact that you've learned. And, and native speakers have that kind of knowledge. But the, here's the problem: the problem is you can't tell a character structure necessarily by just looking at it. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. There are parts of characters that are that look like it's A, but it's actually B. Like, it's literally deceiving you. It's actually not even in the character. It just looks like that thing. Well, there's loads of little things that look 
really familiar. Like I know we've talked about classical a bit before the call. Like when I started, the amount of times I thought it was rare, but it was actually yeah. Mm-hmm. And those stuff like that. There's so many things that just like a little difference that you just miss. Oh yeah, you're talking about sun versus speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, but it, it's even worse than that. Like, <laughs> like there's things that look. For instance, the the example we always give is like May, beautiful, right? Mm-hmm. May, lead in May. The top of it looks like young sheep. Well, I guess it's actually made from a headdress, I think, or something. Right. That was one at the time. Exactly. Exactly. So it has nothing to do with yang. So if you're, so there, any, there's even a traditional story, da, da yang wei mei, yeah, meaning like, oh, the, the big, big sheep, sheep are beautiful, things. right? And there's this whole thing about, oh, they were herders, and so they thought big sheep were beautiful. But that's just not it's pure nonsense. I mean, if you think about what did they think was beautiful? I guarantee you the guys, and back then it was guys that made up the script. They were thinking of women, the vast majority of them. Some of them maybe thought about other men, but most of them thought about women. So if you're trying to create a character that other people are going to understand, you have to you have to go with what everybody thinks, not just what you think, right? So when they're thinking of beauty, it's almost assuredly going to be a woman. Mm-hmm. So to, to have it be a sheep would be really just disturbing. I mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. I was say, that was, so the, I've never even thought about it from that angle before. That would be quite worrying. So the, the first time I heard that story, I was like, there's no way that's true. It just can't be. There's no way that's true. And then years later, when I studied paleography and I came across this character, I was like, I knew it. I knew that wasn't true. <laughs> yeah, I mean. <clears throat> When you word it like that, it seems so blindingly obvious that it wouldn't be in that way. But I guess a lot of the time when you're just struggling to remember the characters, you just kind of accept any story that makes remote sense that someone gives you to see, so, you know, you can learn it and move on to the next one. But if you actually stop and look at it, it's just like, yeah, of, of course it's not talking about a sheep. Right. Yeah. So, so the difference between our stuff and the random stories is that our stuff actually will lead you to understanding the sound and meaning connections towards a random story that, probably on average won't otherwise it's not random right i mean the definition of randomness is that on average it's zero so random stories on average we, we, what we tell people is if you use random stories to learn characters you're going to win the battle you might remember that character but you're going to lose the war eventually the the so, the so for our stuff when whenever you learn our learn the methods using the method that we propose even if your memory story falls away, you can still use the sound and meaning of the thing you're trying to write in order to recall. So it's like you're talking about association, right? So memory memory is, a, is like a big mass network of associations. And if you can pluck a string that will excite another memory, that's how you recall stuff. So what we, what we if you learn our way, we show you that if you use the sound and the meaning of the thing you're trying to write, and you can use those sounds and meanings to pluck your memory strings, it will help you recall the form. In fact, I've done this on it. Like in my, I told you I was in the PhD program for teaching Chinese as a foreign language. We had our qualifying exams were two six hour exams, all in handwritten Chinese with no books, no dictionaries, no computers, no phones, no nothing. And like I memorized like 15 books. I mean, obviously not word for word, but I memorized the content of 15 books to take this exam because they could ask you, for instance, the linguistics exam could ask you anything about linguistics. Zero, there's anything about it. So I had to know the basics of like all the major branches of linguistics. Oh wow! And when I took this exam, I only had trouble remembering how to write a character a couple of times, and one of them was I was going to write. Uh, and I wrote Ting with no problem, and all of a sudden I just stopped on Duan. And I was like, uh, man. And I stopped and thought, when was the last time I wrote this character? And I was like, that's probably a year ago. And I, so then I thought, well, just think through the problem. And I said, okay, so what sound components can produce the sound Duan? And in the margins of my test, I started writing down like Tuan. Uh, and like the right, the left side of like Lun Dun, the Dun, mm-hmm. which you would think is Xiang, Xiang, Shou de Xiang, but actually it's not. This is one, actually one of the things I was talking about. So it looks like Xiang, Shou de Xiang, but it's actually not. It's actually a character that's pronounced Dun or Tuan. 
And so I wrote these sound components down, and then I thought, okay, I happen to remember that the original meaning of duan was to bow down on the ground to where your forehead is touching the ground. Uh, okay, yeah. So then I thought, okay, so what, what semantic components are related to head? So I started writing show, and then all these different, like, yeah, like, the one that means page, yeah, it's actually a picture of a head. It's not has nothing to do with page. And so I started writing down these things, and then when I saw yeah in twin, I knew that these were the two parts. Because you could recognize it. Yeah, and but, but I couldn't remember if it was left to right or right to left, so I wrote down both of them, and the one that I had the stronger intuition about is the one I chose. Well, that's so I was able story. to. But but it's, it happens a lot. Like so, one time I was, when I was at Shada, there was this Korean place in the Shada Night Market. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, they have this really awesome sauce they put on their, on their food. And so I would go to this Korean place a lot. And I, I went there and got a bian dang. And I told them, I, I was like, it's really funny too, because I just got out of a paleography class. I'm using my Chinese for professional academic reasons or whatever. And then I go to this store and I want to tell them, don't tie up my bian dang. And I don't know how to say it. And it's like, I've literally published so papers funny. in Chinese before this. And I, I, I'm like, that's so annoying, you know? Like, so I'm yeah, like, it just uh, goes to show that in second languages, you know, just, I'll get, just get back to that in a second. But, you know, sometimes you can be talking in your area about something really in detail, but then just not know the word for something like shoelace because you've never had to. Right. Had to use know, it before. Like, oh, and then for someone be like, oh, so what is it? Shia, shia, dang. And I'm like, oh, okay. Dang. I just never had to use that word before now. So you just didn't come across it, but you can talk about. You know, like in your case, linguistics and a lot of depth. Right. But not, yeah, that's absolutely fascinating. But something that's very relatable as well. So I, yeah, so, I, so, I, so I'm trying to tell him, like, uh, I'm trying to remember what, what did I, it's like, we all, we all, we all, we all, we all, and they're like, so it up. what? Yeah. what? The, and she's like, what? And then these two other girls come over and they're all three staring at me, and I'm like, uh, we all oh, you can say bunch of lies. Like, do you want to lock them up? Was in like go to prison as well? Yeah, don't, yeah, and they're like, yeah. And I said a couple more. I don't remember what the other ones I said. But then one of them goes, oh, what's that? Tada easy. Tada easy. Just is, we all buy her. Bang chi lai. Yeah, I was gonna say bang chi lai. And I was like, so, oh yeah, Thai. Or, or actually, I didn't. I just said, yeah, yeah, bang chi lai, bang chi lai. We all buy her, bang chi lai. Because I wanted to put my own sauce on. When they put the sauce, they put this little dot, you know. But for me, I would like douse it in the sauce. So I was on my way back to the school and I thought, huh, I wonder if I know how to write this word bang or maybe it's bang. I didn't know at the time. I just thought it could be bang because of a of chi lai, right? So it could be a third. And I thought, well, it means tie up, right? So what what sound components could, could do bang, like the sound bang without a tone, just bang? And I thought of feng, like feng chi lai to seal up. Which is actually the sound component for bang zhu de bang in the fan ti zi, right? Yeah. So I thought of that. I thought of feng, like just being the three lines and the one line down. Um, I thought of like the country or the alliance bang. And then, and then I thought, okay, so those are the possible sound components. And these I didn't write down. I'm just thinking of it in my head. And I thought, well, what are, what are the possible semantic components? It's, like, it's probably going to be... E fu de e or mi zi pang, like the silk component. Mm-hmm. Or it's going to be like jean, like the. <laughs> I don't know if you can tell what I'm writing here. But, uh. Wait. Well, like. Okay, yes. It's like, like, uh, the bottom, actually the bottom of. A pang, pang chu pang, the bottom of its jean. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. So 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 anyway, I thought of all these things, but then when I when I when I saw the silk component with uh, the country bong, I was like, dude, that, I bet that's it. And I looked it up in Plico, and it was it. Well, so so the point is nice. the point is if you if you think of characters in terms of the parts in the character that have a function, and you start off thinking that way. See, so we, we actually have a character course. It's like a 13 lesson. It goes in and teaches you all the important concepts for characters that you need to know. Because a lot of 
Chinese teaches teachers some don't basic know this. characters through the process as well as examples. It teaches you 300 characters basically, but it does. Is that the most common 300 or there's 300? No, it's not examples? the most common. It's not the most common 300, and there's a good reason for that. It's the most common 300 and might not necessarily be the most representative of how the system works. Exactly. It's the most represent. It's, it's we chose characters based upon that they embody what's in the lessons. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, it doesn't matter. The first 300 characters, I mean, the, the point, okay, so if we if we use the first 300 characters, then more advanced students would be turned off by that. They would think, oh, it's just for beginners, but it's not actually just for beginners, because we've had people, one guy yeah, was learning that's Chinese. What I, that's what I turned away courses before, because I was like, oh, it's only 300, but there's so many. And yeah. In hindsight, I think that was a terrible attitude to have when I first started. Well, these, so, 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 so for the beginner, yeah, it'll be totally useful for a beginner, but even for somebody who's been learning Chinese for a long time, but still just can't keep a grasp on the character, the characters just keep falling out of your head. It, it's actually better for these people because you, you won't even care. You, you'll, for the beginning learner, the danger is with our course, the danger is there's so much information that they can't process all of it. It's just going to be if you've already, Yeah. If you already used characters a lot, then you won't be as focused on the individual character. You'll be more focused on the ideas we're talking about, which is what you should be focused on, which is the point of the course. But we've had people, one guy, one guy had been studying for 20 years and he could just never remember characters and he got our course. He can remember characters. Another guy had been studying for six years. And this guy's really, he's a Dutch guy. He's a really smart guy. He's a computer programmer. He's a Kung Fu expert. He's a dance instructor. This dude learns a lot of stuff. But he, he took our course and he's, he's, he posted on our site or somewhere. He's like, before I took your course, like he's, he had, he had to stop doing his Anki reps for a month. And he, so, cause he, cause of work and he got sick and all this stuff. But he, at the end of the month, he goes back to doing his Anki reps. He's like, I was able to remember it was like 283 out of 300, how to write 283 out of 300 characters. Oh. To whereas before I took your course, I wouldn't have been able to write any of them. And that's a over ninety percent recognition rate that I think Anki says you should get, and it's Chinese characters which normally get a lower retention rate than that. Yeah, so he said, yeah. he said if he hadn't taken our course, he'd still be able to recognize a lot of them, but he wouldn't be able to write any of them. He and he was able to write most of them. So that, so a lot of people on this point will push back and say, but I don't care about writing. Well, that's fine. You don't have to care about writing, but but well, I think one it thing helps that, reading as well. It definitely exactly. Helps. That's my my point. Is, my point is this. If you learn how to write and you forget, you can still recognize. If you learn how to recognize and forget, you got nothing. <laughs> right? That's a really good point. So it's actually in your benefit to even learn. And, and the thing is, you know, you don't have to sit there all day. That's pretty much happened right? to me. Like, I, I used to be able to, when, when I was at MTC, when, when we were doing some of the later things in the book, we had to write a lot of, you know, handwritten essays on different topics. And now, I haven't, even only a few months later, if someone, you know, I can still write a few, quite a few basic characters, but if someone told me to write an essay, I, I just forget so much, um, but I can still read an essay fine. Right. But that, it's so yeah. So that's another thing that we talk about on our. We have a blog post about is that what our system does for you is basically it's like having a mental IME, like an input method. So why why do I most a lot of people that can't write Chinese can actually type it into a computer because they use an IME, right? So what they do is they type in say the pronunciation. And they get this list of characters, and they can recognize, right? So they point to the character, right? Our system of learning characters is kind of like having a mental IME. Like once you get good at it, you start thinking along the lines of sound and meaning representation. That plucks your memory strings and brings up candidate characters for you. And then you can just like I was those two stories I told earlier, and. Uh, so I'll make the following audacious claim that if you use our method to learn your characters, you will actually have a better feeling for these characters than native speakers. And what I mean by that is very specific. I don't mean that you'll know when to use the character better than a native speaker. Obviously, that is not true. What is true is that you'll have a better feel for the sound and meaning parts of the character and that you'll be able to use these sound and meaning connections to recall characters is what I mean. Okay. So like... Native speakers actually have a very fuzzy intuition about characters, and the fuzziness comes from a not understanding the structure of each character they learn, and b the differences between Mandarin and historical Chinese. Right. Whereas 
we actually show you in, a, if that, in our advertising, we always say we bring you clarity. Our whole idea is to bring clarity to these characters. Take them out of the realm of being mysterious, weird things and putting them in the realm of being very practical, sound and meaning rep- representation things. And those things, as it turns out, are easier to remember <laughs> than, than the mysterious ones. So I guess I'll, I'll one question quickly and then I want to go off to, to some other points. So you said that course teaches 300 characters and the general principles of... Um, how Chinese characters work. Is there other courses apart from that one as well? Or is it the one? Course? Yeah, there's a. We have a pronunciation course that will teach you the tool. It will give you the tools. I mean, at the at the very worst, you'll have a have a very clear accent. At the very best, if you want to sound like a native speaker, you got to put in the work to do that. But we give you the tools. So we show you. Hey, there's a track. Run around this way, and you got. If you want to run 15 times or 30 times, that's up to you. But the more you run, the better you're going to get at it. But we've had some seriously good results with this course. I didn't actually put this course together. I do some of the lessons, like it's okay. It's actually just like this format. Like th- I think th- there's 13 lessons in that. Three of them are interviews with me. Uh, but John, my business partner, who has excellent, excellent pronunciation, is the one that put that course together. And man, like some of the students will have uploaded their before and after audio. And there's this one, I won't say if it was a girl or boy, but there's this one person in the group. And we're like, oh, man, they're going to ask for a refund. Like they just aren't getting it. Like they just aren't getting anything we're saying. And they hit this one specific lesson and came back. And we heard that audio and literally our jaws dropped. They went from sounding terrible to sounding very close to native like. And it was a matter of days, like three days that that this person had been practicing this one lesson. And we were just, we kept listening to it over and over. We were just so shocked that this person had gone from not getting anything to just nailing it. I mean, it was, it was super impressive. It's really interesting, I guess for a few reasons. I mean, one thing, my probably weakest area is pronunciation, so I was thinking of getting more into shadowing recently. Um, I know I've heard people like Stephen Krashen talk about, yeah, and you probably know, you're, I mean, you'll definitely know a lot more about it than me, but I think one of the things that he says is that everyone almost has the correct pronunciation inside of our brains, because when you've listened to that much, you've been around the language that much, you obviously, you know, you you listen to something that long, you have the voices inside your head, you can almost hear the people speaking, you have the correct pronunciation inside your head, but for whatever reason, whether we feel uncomfortable or don't want to intimidate or feel intimidated or whatever, we, for whatever mental barriers, we don't produce the sound. So he said he says he reckons a lot of, I think, in a some understanding, that a lot of the barriers behind good pronunciation are more psychological than actually physical. Well, it's, I think it's... Mis- okay, first of all, I'm not a huge fan of crashing. <laughs> um, I mean, he says some good stuff, but he takes it to extreme levels. Like, he comes up with this idea of, uh, what is it, I plus one or whatever, like, yep. comprehensible input, which is, okay, it's a great idea. Okay. I mean, it's, it's a very, um, what to say, like, sunshine and rainbows of a look at how language learning would work. So it's very easy to say that you want input that's so compelling that you just want to hear the story and it wants to be at exactly your level but a little bit higher but then when you first start a language you understand nothing and right. if you don't understand it it's going to be probably really boring so right. you know there's a lot of practical implications that mean it might not necessarily work as well, well but I think- none of that even bothers me I, i'm okay with having stuff rough around the edges like for me i just care if it works or not but the thing that i have a problem with is and he goes on to say it's the only way out there in existence to, to acquire a language. Mm-hmm. And that I completely disagree with, d- disagree with for the fact that, A, we don't really understand what the brain's doing. B, I've had a lot of experiences as a language learner where, like, for instance, in, I was living in Holland and I come out and say some word that I, I can't remember ever having learned or even heard, but I just knew how to say it and I don't even know why. Well, maybe you don't remember hearing it, which is... Well, that's probably what it was. Subconscious... But, but that goes against yeah. comprehensible input, right? If I don't remember hearing it, it's not comprehensible input. Or, or I guess if you if you were so immersed in the story at the time, you might not have realized that you understood it because you were just focusing on the thing that was happening in the story in real life, that you were focusing so much on the context that you didn't focus on the word. And I think that's what he means by compelling. So I think that does sound like it fits into the theory from my perspective. Um I was going to say something else as well. 
Um, but, but I, yeah, sorry, carry on. That's okay. That's okay. But but to back up, so shadowing is good, but I think one of the, one of the, what, what you really want to do is chorusing. So chorusing. Chorusing. So what's that mean? Shadowing is good, but it's for, it's used for a different purpose than chorusing. Chorusing is when you like say something a gazillion times. Like oh, okay. for instance, have you heard of a um, YouTube on a, a YouTube a polyglot on YouTube called Lauma? Uh-uh. Chris, um, he uses a very similar sentence method. What's his name? So, yo, what's up? What's your mouth? Very loud, ma. What's your hey, mate? Wu Zhong, you in the Mei Warren? And then he, oh, I mean, I can show you a quick video now, just for reference. I think he's, he's one of the better sounding um, Chinese speakers that I've seen. Hello, <laughs> everyone. Yeah. That's so. so idea. It's so different from the Mandarin I'm used to, but yeah. Like like uh, northern Chinese. Yeah, accent. so northern. Yeah, but I think. But it he, sounds he, good. I mean, he sounds does like, like he... a similar sentence method, and I think. Like he sounds really, really good to me. Like, yeah, it sounded it sounded very northern. Yeah. Yeah, um, and he he used the, what it sounds like is the course approach that you're doing. So he basically said, for he said for a period of like three or four months, he got about twenty sentences, of this one person just selected them to be like we call them you know so it's like to like mm-hmm. the represent the language i guess and then you just listen to them over and over again and he basically said every day for like two hours he was practicing it and the and you know he spent wow. like hours and hours practicing the one sentence and then maybe a few days later he went to the next sentence so i think it was a total of like six hours over the course of two months Dude. on one sentence and he did that for 20 sentences so I do, I do like, <laughs> I, I do a thousand, like if I'm trying to learn a new sound or something, or maybe a new grammar concept, I'll, I'll go over a sentence a thousand times and I record it in five minute increments mm-hmm. and then. You mean just like using um, Audacity and just copying and pasting the sentence over and over? Yeah, yeah, for five minutes. And then I, I count the number of times that it appears in that five minutes and figure out how many times I have to listen to the five minute segment to get to a thousand but dude, I can't do that more than five minutes. If I do that, yeah. if I were to do that ten minutes a day, I would lose my mind. I mean, because you're I like think, literally I think he did the Pomodoro it's... technique as well. Like he did it like you know twenty five minutes and stop. But the thing that really um, resonated me resonated with me when he was speaking about the method, and I guess I'll leave a link in the description for anyone who's interested, is he talks about how you don't just want to you know just be parroting and think like you don't just want to be parroting it back when you hear it. And you hear yourself speak after you want to be thinking, right, where exactly is the sounds different? Look at that person's mouth yeah. shape. Look at my mouth shape. What's the position of the tongue like? Position of their lips like? Positions of their teeth like? Yeah. You know, are the muscles tense or are they loose? And you've got to just like think about all these differences. Yeah. And it's actually like a brain exercise, not just a mindless power thing exercise. Yeah. And I think that's probably, I think it's that mindset um, makes a difference. And he teaches like American English to Chinese people. And the way he talks about the mouth positions of and when you pronounce certain sounds in English, I'm just like, are you? And then I have to kind of like speak and then kind of feel what my mouth's doing. And we're like, oh, yeah, that is what we do. Or what we, you know, English sounds in general. But just the, the knowledge of like mouth positions and stuff, I think, is really useful for that. Well, it's useful, too, like even with characters. If you're thinking like, is this, could this thing be a sound component in this? Like, I remember the character P, like uh, like a hand and then B, B feng shuo to B. Mm-hmm. I remember the first time I saw that, and I knew nothing about phonology and linguistics back in those days, and I was like, man, I want to believe it's a sound component, but that's P, and the, that's a B, and no, they're not the same letter, right? But actually, if you if you do an experiment, like, say it out loud, buh, puh, buh, puh, and then throw in another random letter, buh, puh, cuh, and then think about where it is in your mouth, buh, puh, or obviously coming from the same uh, place, is different uh, from uh, cuh, like buh, puh, cuh. Yeah. Bupa. Bupa is the same place in the mouth. It's just that your are your the manner of it in linguistics you call it manner of articulation is different. So, so that reminded me of what I wanted to ask you because you said burpa and your burpa murfa. Like, yeah. Did you learn Taiwanese? Are you did you learn Taiwanese Mandarin? Because you lived there for so long and like did you well, choose I, a uh, like a parent so to speak or like someone to model or did you just do it for a, a range of speakers? Well, so um. How do I say this? 
I, so I started off learning basically mainland Chinese Mandarin, and it wasn't until I actually – I actually met some Taiwanese people here in Texas, but then I went to Taiwan. I went to actually went to China first. Uh, I used to be an engineer, and I was working as an engineer, and I took three weeks oh, off. What, what, what discipline? Electrical engineering. I did. Uh, <laughs> so my Mandarin, like I said, I've been learning it for a really long time, and I, I started on it way before the internet was even a thing. So basically, I think when I got there's some benefits to that as well, just in terms of con- um, concentration. Yeah. Was the concentration. Well, there's also a lot of downsides, but I think there is some benefits. But anyway, that's a different topic. I'm not going to well, go got, down that rubber hole now. I, I got to Taiwan in 2005, and I had a really crappy – I spoke fluent Chinese, but with a really bad accent. And actually, the accent, the sounds were fine. It was the tones that were just completely American, basically. They weren't really tones. And I knew it was a problem. I just didn't know how to fix it. And then in 2007, I went to a – thing with the uh, famous linguist and we were at Leiden University in the Netherlands and I was hoping to impress him with my Chinese because I'd actually lived in the country and all this stuff and then he pulled me aside it was like a two-week seminar so he pulled me aside one day he's like Ash man your tones they suck like you really gotta do something about it and I'm like I just I laughed and he, bl- 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 your pride at the well time. it was it, well it was it was obviously it wasn't fun but I knew it was a problem and so I just laughed because that's all I could do and I got back to Taiwan, and I tried to. I, I was. I'm a very stubborn person, so it's very difficult to get me to change my mind about something. <laughs> so I, I started trying to quote unquote fix the problem, but my mindset was completely wrong. And it took so, me r- years. Wrong in what way? Actually, it's also, also related to. It's also, to it's also related to the the crashing thing you're talking about. About why is it that somebody can listen to a language over and over and over and still say it wrong. And it's because of what I call the letter framework, right? So what is the letter framework? The letter framework is when I learn the language, I learn pinyin and I'm, I'm doing oh, it by okay, reading. So it's basing off English phonology. Well, it's based on letters. So when you hear people talk, you're trying to translate that into letters in your head. And when you memorize words, you memorize letters on a page. And so you're using these letters. And when you're listening, you're not listening for the sound. You're listening for what letter are they saying? And you're trying to piece these letters in your head to understand what these people are saying. But when you do that, you're not listening to the sound. If you're not listening to sound, you're not going to be able to reproduce it. If you're, Reproducing sound comes from active, like you were talking about, thinking about what is my mouth doing? What is their mouth doing? What is the position of my lips? Where's my tongue? Why does what? You're, you're constantly asking yourself, uh, why does what I say sound different from what they're saying? Right. So first of all, you have to know that it's different. And then second of all, you have to think about how to go about correcting it. And then you have to actually correct it and make it a habit to say it correct the right, you know. Like actually, as John John says in our course, it's not enough to be able to say the sound right. You have to keep practicing until you can't get it wrong. That's the key. Mm-hmm. That's the difference between people that do it really well and people that do it average or poor. And I think so, also that you're not pronouncing it right through just muscle memory alone but that if you said it wrong you hear that it's wrong hear right. that it's wrong as well because it's not just um, it's not just hearing i mean hearing is very important but like like uh, there's an anecdote like the i tell step though, right well so there's this polish dude that lived in the united states for like 20 30 years and this is a uh my some my dad used to be a sales guy salesperson and then this is a story this guy told him this polish guy he lived in the u.s for 20 30 years he thought he had a perfect american accent uh, I know by your standards, there's no such thing as a perfect American accent, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. But anyway, his the, the the Polish guy's grandkid like recorded him talking when he didn't know he was being recorded, and then he played the recording for him, and the guy was just blown away at how un-American or non-American his accent was, because in his mind, it was a perfect American accent. But when you hear the recording, the recording don't lie. You know, you all your mental tricks that get from what you're actually making to you thinking it's perfect that aren't there when you're hearing a recording of yourself. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, which so, is why I guess recordings are so helpful. But but there's but it's also helpful to know that you're probably deceiving yourself. Like if you haven't done a lot. In fact, I have actually a video on YouTube about what does it mean when somebody says, 哇, 你中文讲得很好. 
It means that it they're nice. <laughs> that's exactly what it means. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean that your Chinese is actually good. In most cases, maybe some people mean that, but I I lived in Taiwan for a long time and I've met people from mainland. I think people from the mainland are much they seem to be less likely to give compliments, mm-hmm. but people in Taiwan are just being nice. That's really fun. Uh, just a quick, I've got a quick anecdote of that, and then you can go. Like, we sure. my family were visiting me over Chinese New Year, and my brother, my brother was like, "Oh, how do you, you know, say thank you?" He knew it was like shisha, but he didn't know. He wanted to like, okay, well, how do I say it properly? And he just then he goes went to the Taiwanese person. He was like, shisha, and then the ta- Taiwanese man turns around and goes, "Wow, he Chinese speaking very well." And then my brother turns to me and goes, "What does he say? What's he saying? I don't understand." <laughs> So, you know, it just goes to show that it's, um, yeah, it's, I think it's just, uh, them trying to show appreciation for you trying right. to show appreciation for their language is the kind of way I see it in my head. Cause I used to be, find it patronizing before, but I know it's coming from a good place. So I think it's just a way of showing appreciation. I mean, yeah, with some, I, I don't think everybody, I think maybe with some people that, I mean, there, I think there's a lot of different motivations. I mean, I don't think it's 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 fair to say that everybody that says that has the same motivation because mm-hmm. some of them do, some of them do. I don't know. I mean, I I you know, yeah, I got a lot of experience dealing with those <laughs> dealing with comments. But so in our in our, on our YouTube video, I say if if somebody says to you, "Wow, did you grow up here?" Then you really are speaking well, right? Or if they say wow, you sound like you're Taiwanese, then you're speaking really well. They're not going to say that to somebody who's not really speaking well. Mm-hmm. But if they Although just say... I think, um, if you ask your friends, they'll be more likely to be brutally honest about how good you are as well, because when I was in Taiwan for a few months and I went to Bar like a Baozi, and you know, my, my pronunciation now is not amazing. My pronunciation then was a lot worse than it is now. I always used to mix up the A... O and the OU sounds between Cantonese and Mandarin, so I used to be like, yeah. or the Tao instead of Tol or whatever, and you know, sort of messed that up a lot. So my pronunciation was pretty bad. And then some Taiwanese woman, when I went to buy the Bowser, she said, Oh, now, she ni, ba hai, she ni ma she Taiwan ren. I was like, eh? Yang do bu shi a. And, you know, she was obviously thought that, and I think it's because there's like this double standard that if, if an ABC or a BBC or I mean American born Chinese or a British born Chinese or someone goes to Taiwan, they think and there's a there's a YouTuber called uh, Taiko Zhu Chang, which is of TK Story, which did a video on this, that if they go there they're like and they speak as well as I am now, they'd be like, Whoa, you what's what's wrong with your Chinese? Why does it suck? But if I do it, they'd be like, Wah san you jungle hun how Yeah. Sort of thing. So it's like, well why is you know and I think that they were asking that because in their head that most people that go don't learn Chinese, so if, if I can speak to even that level with a bad accent, then it must mean that it's something more than just an average foreigner. Right. Yeah, actually, when I switch when I switch between Mandarin and Cantonese, I have a little calibration sequence I go through. <laughs> Seriously, because otherwise I get, I get because the same the ao the ao o thing. I say kai hai kai hai kai hai ao ta. <laughs> so there's like this sequence I go through the, to like to adjust. try to fix that problem. Yeah. It's almost like a one-to-one mapping and it's like the reverse. So it's confusing. Well, yeah. the thing is sometimes sometimes they switch out O to Ao and Ao to O, but then sometimes they're the same. So it's that's yeah, it's times just, are the it's same. It's hard from there to confuse you that we're regular. Right. Yeah. Um, I love Cantonese. It's, it's got a. I have to say, if you're trying to like go for an immersion-based approach, then I think the cinema's probably a lot better quality than Taiwanese cinema. Yeah. 